Hello, and welcome to Live Coding Happy Hour for January 12th, uh, 2018. That's the hard part. I know. It's, I did the it's same January. Thing it's a and new what, year. It, yeah, what year is it? What day is it? Everything has a pause after it. <laughs> uh, yes, we are back. Uh, so I'm Josh Neri. I'm a developer advocate here in the developer program and uh, excited to be back. It was good to be away for a little bit. Uh, with me today, Dave. Hey, I'm Dave Slusher, developer advocate. And driving today. Hey, I'm Chuck Tomasi, <laughs> ServiceNow guy with the red bow tie. Uh, so yeah, we're really happy to be back. Chuck has agreed to uh, drive for us today. He's going to be working on some... What are you working on? We are going to be or... finishing up part one of the uh, Amazon Dash Button integration. When we, I think we did this in November, of all things. We hooked it up, and we got it to respond and put a record in ServiceNow and take a little action on that. We're going to expand upon that. So... It won't be so much, I'll do a review, but it won't be so much about the dash button and how the information gets there, but we're going to be pushing that thing a lot today. Very, very cool. I'm actually really excited too because I was not here for the last one. I was somewhere. I was, I think I was somewhere in Seattle is where I was, if I remember correctly. I was walking around in the woods and on a short, not rainy period of time while I was out there and missed all the fun. You weren't so. watching live? Come on, I tune in when I'm sitting at an airport. <laughs> I, I'm not joking. <laughs> I actually did fire up the YouTube app and I submitted a comment just to be like, hey, wish I could be there. But anyway, uh, so let's see, slightly longer intros if those are a thing. Uh, we've pretty much, most people here know what we are, but since it's a new year, um, maybe we should just kind of recap what we're doing. So live coding happy hour is where a couple of guys get on YouTube and hit the go live button and write some code that may or may not work. Um, we actually started this a little over a year ago. I think we've got, uh, 50 some odd episodes now. And I found the original conversation back in Slack where Dave and I were talking about this. And I was like, Hey Dave, there's this thing. There was some demo we were working on. And I'm like, what if we just what if we just go live with the thing that's not ready and show people the process of fighting through whatever this problem was we were having at the time? And that is how this was born. And we've been doing it for over a year now and having a ton of fun. And uh, we're back for another year. So hopefully it's another good one. Um, as we always do on Live Coding Happy Hour, we drink beer. Um, I'll start. I've got always a new one. Short Fuse Brewing Company in Schiller Park, Illinois. It is the Imperial. Oh, there's the camera. The Imperial Stout of Impending Doom. <laughs> <laughs> I love the creative name these brewers have. I'll go second. I have my last bottle of Deschutes Fresh Squeezed IPA. Now, you might think there's citrus in there, and I think there's a bit of it, but it's neither heavily citrus nor heavily hoppy, which is why I like it. All right, and I'm going with the Sweet Baby Java which I frankly don't remember if I've done it on here or not. Um, it's uh, from Duclaw Breweries. It's, uh, if you remember, I had the really old chocolate peanut butter porter from uh, Terrapin, the Liquid Bliss. It was like a year or more old when I drank it. Um, this is very, very similar. It is a espresso-infused uh, chocolate peanut butter porter. And so for weight reasons, I no longer eat candy. So this is like, my, I, like drinking a Reese's bar, <laughs> Reese's cup. So... Uh, I, I kind of get the 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 vicarious thrill of uh, having a little chocolate and a little peanut butter, but uh, they have a sweet baby Jesus beer, and this is the one that's uh, which I think maybe is just straight chocolate peanut butter porter. This is uh, infused with espresso, so which I can also nice. use right now. Well, I'm going to task our viewers to uh, create a tracking app to what have we what drink, what episode, and what did we rate it. <laughs> Because yeah, we can't keep track anymore. <laughs> it's called the Untapped API. <laughs> yeah, if you integrate with Untapped, then that's even better. Uh, <laughs> Someone will write a REST API, but then you won't know what episode it's for. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chuck, I will hand this over to you. We've got a little bit of weird finagling to do with Skype and the way we're sharing this out because Skype is new and it has new weird windows, and that's why my head is bigger than theirs. Um, <laughs> I'm still using the old Skype. I can still find the share screen option. There we go. Hey, uh, just so people are saying there's uh, sound issues on the oh. stream. Uh-oh. No sound here. Let me unmute my laptop. We will pause for a moment while we figure out I the hear sound it. thing. Yeah, I'm hearing it too. All right, I'm going to we're going to assume I we're going to assume that these are localized problems or else that it got fixed in the, you know, couple minutes since you guys post that posted that. Um 
but we're getting we're getting sound on our own thing. So if we'll, you keep having we'll issues, careful. let us know. Okay. I got sound here. I'll post that back. Let me turn off my camera. Yeah, I do need my camera up. I need the little avatar in the bottom. Because you see this lamp that's right over here? Um, I don't actually see it. Hang on. Uh, you got to look at my avatar. I don't know if this is going to work, Josh, or if we need to do some finagling with the cameras. There is a lamp just off to my right. Right in front of the Dalek. Uh, I don't see it yet. We're going to figure this out in live coding style. Um, where is Did the I turn thing? my camera off? No, it's... It's thanks to... No, oh. it's only it's only yeah, showing it's only us. showing the screen share. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh well, that'll be a little tough one. Well, let me do this. Let me go here. Um, we can see now. We see we see your head, but that is so small that I don't that's think right. that's gonna. But help that's us. all right because the light will the light will. Uh, let me let me see when that comes up. Oh yeah, it's just the head on the title bar. That's all right. Tell you what, let's. Uh, yeah. Josh can Josh can work on this. You maybe have a little inset okay. box uh, while you go forward, Chuck. All right. So we don't have so, to hold up the whole thing. Sure. The um, the backstory of this is I, I – why did I buy these things? <laughs> I don't remember why I bought the dash buttons. I think it was uh, just to try something out and do a little research on AWS. I was inspired one day by uh, Matt Saxton, who joined us for the last show that we did this on. He, he was at Knowledge 15, 16, and did a hack – hackathon hack with some consumer dash buttons. You press the button and something would happen and he was intercepting the uh, Wi-Fi signal with Node.js and turning it into an action and service now. I said, hey, Josh, let's take this a little further. We decided to go from consumer to a little more professional. So I ordered up a couple of the AWS IoT buttons. You can get them on Amazon for about $20 each. And I said, hey, not only do you get a, a, a better programming experience, but you also get better inputs from these. It will recognize a single press, a double press, and a long press. So that's something valuable because now the same button can do three different actions. And what I did is I brought that into ServiceNow through a scripted REST API. On Amazon, there is a, a function, a Lambda function in Node.js that is triggered when I press the button. So I press the button. The request, it wakes up the Wi-Fi. You see the, the light goes flash, 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 green. A little, a little slower than that, but you get the idea. And sends the request off to Amazon. It says, what do you want me to do with it? Oh, I'm going to do this HTTP request to the endpoint that you specified. And I could probably bring that up real fast if I could remember. I just type in AOS, IoT button. Actually, I think it's console.something AWS. That might be it. <laughs> and while you're bringing that up, I have a, um, it's not a great solution, but it's a solution that will work. When you want to show your your screen, just tell me and I will hit a button that will show your camera full screen momentarily. Okay. So we'll just switch back and forth. I'm going to make this font a little bigger in just a sec. I can't type and font change at the same time. Next. And password should change that password because now my kids know it and they order things on Amazon. Tried getting them an account of their own for Christmas. Okay, so this is the Amazon workbench and I have probably another page that I got to make bigger. Waiting, waiting, waiting as I say on live community stream, slow browser, take a drink. Okay, so what I did is I defined two functions. One is just a copy of the other because one's going to one instance and one's going to another. And I said, here is my dash button. I registered it through the AWS IoT app on my phone. Very quick, very easy. You hold it down, it turns into an access point. The light's flashing blue. You join the network, you register it very easy. And you say, use my home network and all that good stuff like any other IoT device like thermostat, like a smart outlet. And they give you this little... Box. You could do this in Python or you could do it in Node. I chose Node 6.10 and said, go get these environment variables. Here are my options. I'm going to do authorization. I put some authorization on this. I don't think that was on there last time, uh, which just creates some basic authentication for security. So even if you guys have the name and password 
or the endpoint. You can't pulverize my instance. And then use the environment variables. I'll show you the three of them, but I won't tell you the account. I've got the path. I've got the uh, host name that I'm going to target. And those go into the response or the request, excuse me, the HTTP request that goes out. Now, what's listening on the other end is my inbound scripted REST API. So this is my listener on ServiceNow. So the button gets pressed, the Lambda function kicks off, it sends an HTTP request in this direction to ServiceNow, and it simply creates a record in what I call the hit table. A button was hit, big whoopie doo. It then effectively is an event management system now. I say, what do you want me to do with that? So I put a business rule on the hit table and said, let's go figure it out. Based on these rules, I have some actions. I call them actions. Rules probably would have been a little more effective. But I have the dash actions. And right now, I use a condition field and a table template field, I believe it is. And this was all done on the last episode. We'll put a backlink to that one on there. So it says, if the button is Mr. Kofefe, create an incident with the short description, this caller, and it will create a record. What I want to do now is expand upon that and let it run any script. I'm going to put a script field on here. It says, you don't just have to do this pragmatic stuff of condition builder, table, have fun with it, with the field values. I want to extend that into scripting capabilities. And to make it more fun, I've created uh, over Christmas, because that's what I do, is geeky things like this. I created an API to turn on my TP link smart switches and smart uh, outlets. I have this lamp over to my right connected to my uh, smart switch. It's a mini smart mini plug. I just call it office light and I put together this form and I'll show you what one of the UI actions looks like. It's just calling a script include that says turn the light on or turn the light off. I can't even get the state. By the way, I contacted TP-Link and said, are you going to make this API public? They said, no, it's proprietary information. And I said, well, it's published out there. And uh, by the way, companies with public APIs tend to do a little bit better in the market space. So maybe I nudged them, maybe not. We'll see what happens. But in the meantime, uh, I say, just set the device state of the current record to one, and it passes in all the yummy device information that I got back. I won't get into the details of that API and the whole thing right now, but I just get a whole bunch of stuff back from my uh, my TP-Link account. They call it CASA, so I call it the app CASA. And if I click the turn on light, sends that request, and ding, light goes on. I don't know if you saw that anywhere on the screen. I just I just switched over your video, so if you want to okay. toggle it the other way, we can watch it go off. All right, here we go. And I click the UI action that says turn off, and bing, the light goes off. Isn't That's that fast. amazing? Okay, I can do that through service now. Now, that was fun. Let's do that through, let, let's connect this to the dash button. So I've got two different apps here. One is the Casa app that controls the lights, and the other is the dash button that, that monitors the switch. So in order to do that, I am going to go to the actions and modify this form because I need some more goodies on here. One of which is a script field. This is where it gets a little, a little, a little new territory for some. I put together a hack lab at knowledge 16 and 17, and I may still have the PDFs for those somewhere. But let's, um, let's just do, I don't know if you can do script fields in form designer, but we're going to find out. Configure form design. And I not only need that script field, but I'm going to do like a business rule. You know, you check the advanced button and the script field pops up. That's what I want. That's what I want. So let's go to field types, script. Well, oh, you know what? Am I in the wrong scope? I thought I was in the dash scope. I'm in the dash scope. Okay. Let's try form layout. Maybe there's things you just don't want to let your novices do in form designer. <laughs> It's entirely possible. I like the way you look at that. Well, it's script and script or script plane. Uh, well, script script gives you the editor. Well, plane is still a script field and it's treated like a script, but it is just, I believe, plain text. I want that. 
and then add a true false for turning the advanced on and off. I'm um, trying to think if there's anything else I need. Not really that I can think of. Okay, let's put advanced. Um, do a little layout here. Split, split, split. Um, never gave this thing a description, did I? You could probably be nice and say description because I think all we had on that list was a date. We kind of threw the other one together really fast. So let's do a string of 100. Add that at the top. It'll be like our name field. Then we'll split. Mm, let's put advanced right across the street from active. We'll put our check boxes up together, make it look nice. Then condition we had. I'm visualizing this in my head. Condition. Then our table field value script. <clears throat> That's nice. You know what? Yeah, we'll do that. So hit a save there. See how it looks. And obviously, we don't want the script field on the form when we're not in advanced mode. So a quick UI action would be, or UI policy would be very nice here to show the script only if it's advanced. So let's do that. We can do that in about 30 seconds, right? Configure UI policy. I think it's going to have to do two things. It's going to have to hide the other stuff too, the, the table and field values. So, wow, taking a while to draw those annotations. Is advanced. I'm not very good at naming my UI policies today. We'll go with. That seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> it sounds more like a variable name. <laughs> <laughs> if advanced is true, then you got me on that kick of naming Boolean variables like is something. Then let's go to the UI policy actions. This is actually a lot more fun in studio because you get to see live related lists. Oh, yeah. We're going to set the script field as visible true. And set the other two as false. So they toggle back and forth. So basically, it's not additive. It's not like a... No. I think there are some areas of the platform where you click advanced and then the thing in the script also runs, but this is more of... It's either advanced or it's not. Right, right. So let's hide the table. Make that false. I'm not worried about mandatory fields right now. And I will be pushing these new updates back to GitHub. I think they're on my personal GitHub, so Chuck Tomasi, if you wanted to fork this thing and play with it. Uh, and, and the CASA API is all the, also out there. Let's hide the table, and let's also hide the, what did I call it, field values? At least I'm consistent. Make that false. All right, quick test of that. Let's take a look at our actions form. Just want to make sure it's behaving logically. Then we'll get to the coding part. This really isn't that tricky. Okay, script field should go bye-bye. And should flip to the other interface. Looks pretty good. I think that'll work. What do you think? That makes sense. So just because I missed out last time, I wasn't here, when... In when it's not advanced, what's happening with the table in the fields? It's basically creating a it's record just, and then setting those values? Yes, lines. it's going to do an insert on this table of that thing. I mean, we okay. can test that if you want. It still works. Got it. So I have one registered button right now, and that is my Mr. Kofefe, or as I call him, button A. And it just says, anytime you see a, a, one of those rest payloads or a table hit record with this ID, because the table hit record is pretty stupid, it just says, oh, you got, the payload comes in and says, here's a serial number or an ID, here's the voltage, and here's the button click type. Went, oh, good. You know, I got to turn this ugly serial number of G030MD, whatever, into something a little more representative of what it actually is. So I just create this button registry. That's the hit record. I want the registry record. 
all I did is say, if you see this ID, come on, back to the ID table. If you see this ID, it's associated with this other description. Here's a friendly description for this ugly ID. So when I get a hit record, in fact, let's just watch it. I'm going to hit a double hit. Since there's no double hits, I go bam, bam. White, 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 white. I'm narrating what it's doing. Green. There's the request out, and that's how fast it came in. You saw it right there. There's a double hit on that button. So what I want to do is, so let's set up a new action. And in here. <laughs> Sorry, somebody in chat says Chuck made a hit record. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever. Very clever. Turn lamp on. Okay. And if the button is Mr. Kofefe. I only have one button, so it's pretty easy. Oh, the, oh, and I have to hit advanced. Then uh, I need some stuff in here, and I want to be able to run some other stuff, but I also want to pass in some stuff. Like, hey, what button was hit? What do you know about this, and how can I get it there? So before I go too far into this, eventually I, what I want is uh, something like new... I got to get the Casa API in front of me to see what I'm actually doing, but it's um, here, var ku is my Casa utils x six six two three eight Casa utils no ku dot set device name state. Now, the UI action just said set device state, and it passed it a current record, but I don't, my current record here is action record, maybe? I don't have that much information about it. So what I'd like to do is office lamp, pass it a name instead, and then the value one for on, zero for off. I didn't define any magic values. Something like that. So that's my goal. Right now, this script field does absolutely nothing. We have to hook that part up. And we will hook that up in the business rule that's doing the lookup. Now, here's the magic trigger. This is, this is something I learned on another project. The, the light is going on and off with a REST API out to my TP link account. You can't run a script, a REST API in a, in a before or after business rule. I thought I found a bug in the platform. This drove me nuts until one of the uh, REST guys told me, no, this has to be async. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is an important note if you're dealing with REST APIs in business rules. It will come to bite you. Don't, don't bang your head for half a day like I did. Okay. And it's only going to run when a new record is inserted, which is nice because it says, hey, you've got a record in the hit table. What do you want to do with it? It doesn't matter if you've updated it, and frankly, I don't update those records anyway. Now, over in the advanced section, this is where we wrote the glide filter checker. It goes through the actions table and says, are you my record? Are you, do, do you match my conditions? Is it this button and these many hits? Is it this button and that many hits? And it just finds all the things that match, because you could have multiple things trigger with one button hit. That's the cool part about this. It's very flexible. It's not just one record hit and one action. It could be one record hit and five actions. Go turn on this light and set that and do this other stuff and create a record in service now over here. I could have lots of things happen. But this is only looking for, it's only doing the insert part mm, on the field values. We talked about at, apply encoded query as the magic ingredient that made that happen. So what I need to do is inject a little more information. So after we match a glide filter check record and says, okay, go check all the actions and find the ones that match the conditions. I'm going to use my good friend glide scoped evaluator. Scroped. <laughs> you ever use this, Josh? I have, and it's amazing. It does a pretty cool class. This is the smart way of doing an eval in JavaScript. Like, you can't do an eval in a scoped application. It won't let you. I think it, even the script editor comes up and goes, uh-uh, you're not going there. What I want is first to see if I can run the script. 
So let's do evaluator dot evaluate, evaluate script. Checking my spelling as I go. You, um, your initial declaration is actually uh, drunk. New. A vol alerter. I need a new. Eval, evla, evaluator. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> that, that sounds like an asynchronous action right there. <laughs> evaluator. There's a podcast I listen to where it has a as a character is always making up something like the something something you later. <laughs> it just it just smacked me in the face. Okay, and what I pass it is the current record that action, and I can put this here. And I found out later that you if the field name is script, and boy howdy, I hope it's script. <laughs> Check. <laughs> it might be you underscore script because I did it from form layout. Let's find out. If it's script, come on. Loading, loading, loading. UI policy. Come on. Ah, it's not even the right one. I want to turn lamp on. Come on, I only have two actions in here. Okay. If this is called script, you don't need the second argument. Good. It's called script. I like to put it in there just to be explicit. There's no guessing what it actually is. Uh, if you're dealing with a global application, yeah, you're going to need U underscore script, whatever it is. So that's going to let me do evaluator dot uh, run that script. And then really, that, that should be it. It's not everything we want, but it's getting there. So yeah, let's give that a try. Those are the, really the two key ingredients that I remember. There's there's actually a third ingredient, but I'm curious. Like I want to see what you do first, and then I have a thought for you. Okay. Depending on where this goes, I like. The I don't group want. Think I, I don't want to steal your thunder potentially. So okay. <laughs> I'm gonna I, say I, I have a way. couple of ideas left that I want to try to implement if, if we get time. It's only half past the the hour long show. So in theory, in theory. We should match this condition, button is Mr. Kofefe, and run this script asynchronously. Fingers crossed. I am going to, let's go to the hits table just to see if we get the hit. We, we have system logs all at the ready on my favorites. Let's see what happens. Did I say, oh, I didn't say single click. I got to change that action. It's not smart enough yet. Because I'd like single click to turn the light off, double click to turn the light off. I want, oh, you know what I mean. So um, right now, would it just run in both cases then? Yes, it will run in all cases. It'll say, oh, hey, the button was hit. And it'll create an incident record too. <laughs> the overly eager action. Maybe I should disable that. Let's do an and click type is single. Yeah, that would help. Filter down our clicks a little bit. But, you know, that might be a use case where you have if this button is clicked for any reason, any form, any format, and then we'll turn this one off so it doesn't create an incident record for us. Although that would might, might be a nice troubleshooting thing to make sure that, why did this one work and that one didn't? Okay. Nice cross scope privileges being announced to us. Let's go to the hits and I'm going to hit it once. Boom. White, 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 white. Does the lamp turn on? I am turning, uh, I just switched over to video Green. so people can see. Just we in case. got our single click record, but something didn't work with the script. Uh -oh. okay. Lamp did not turn on. Let's go to system logs all. This is where it gets fun. Mm -hmm. Things don't always work like they should on live coding happy hour. And we get illegal access to private script include in the CASA scope. Guess what Chuck didn't do? Oh, uh... Chuck? Did Set not your... make the other one. Yeah, I'm going to shut down studio for just a sec and go to studio and bring up the CASA API. My script include is private. Yeah. Um, we'll just to it. answer a question while uh, you're doing that, uh, yeah. Freddie asks, uh, is there a single place that all the functions and methods that make up ServiceNow? Why, yes, my friend, there is. <laughs> Developer.servicenow.com. Uh, if you look at that there, in the header, there's a, a link in the nav for API, and you can find uh, uh, all the APIs up there. 
And it's got them kind of broken down whether they're client side, server side, uh, scoped, not scoped, that sort of thing. I think I also need to upload a new version of this because this is the function where I turn the device on or off. So I use a token. I believe this is a UUID version 4 token. You can find a place that generates them for you. You stick it in the API, and it sends out the REST response and gets all of the devices for your related account. So you send it the UUID and your credentials, and it comes back and goes, here's a JSON payload full of your stuff. And then I create a device list out of each one of those, calling create device. Then here's set device state, just sends out another request with a specific payload. And here is, oh, do I not have the device state name one in there? I thought I did. Yeah, there it is. It says, whatever name you gave me, like office lamp, I'm going to try and do a glide record lookup to get that device from the device list and then just call set device state. So these are sort of stacked on each other. What I didn't do, but the methods are there. And it's only available to this application scope, which is not very pleasant when you're trying to run it from another application scope. Oh, what would have really been fun, you know, we should try if we get a chance, is the, um, the new cross-application scopes in Kingston, where I can say this script include is allowed to this application. So I can say dash is allowed to use it, but maybe global is not. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah, I know that's there, and I've never played. I have not played with it yet. So this would be the place where we play with it. <laughs> Let's get After it working it first. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so restricted, restricted caller access. I think is what it's called. Yep. Okay. I did do that presentation a couple of times. So let's go back to the hits. I'm gonna try pressing the button one more time. Wait. White, 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 white. Man, it's warm in this studio. Single click. No light. Logs. Logs, anyone? I got an alert on my watch. <laughs> that was interesting. <laughs> uh, the undefined value has no property caused by error in. So it's saying var ku casa utils. What line is it barking about? It just doesn't like my script. Line two. So... Is it? Does it say line two in there somewhere? Here, let's look at the the record. Is six six two three eight the correct scope? Or maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was designed on another instance. Because it sounds like you're trying now to dereference a variable that does not, or you have a no object or something. The other thing that I like doing in my script fields is putting things in an encapsulated function. One of those I E I E F F. What are those called? Dave remembers uh, the acronym better than if I do. Uh, uh, I have yeah, immediately executed function. Immediately invoked function ex execution. So the scope is yeah. in fact 66238 CASA utils. Let's make sure we're using it correctly. Let's switch back to the dash app and go to our business rule action lookup. Function expression, that's the last two words. Immediately invoked function expression. Immediately invoked I I F E. I can't remember which letter is duplicated, kind of like spelling occasionally. Okay. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the actual script out of the action record. But I may come back to that action business rule. Click Mr. True here. And did I get the right? Scope, I didn't put new. Uh, I seem to have a deficiency with this today. <laughs> do you just not like new things? <laughs> I expect them to run. <laughs> I declared it. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. We know we're going to so, get a hit record. So yes. just out of curiosity, what was actually happening? You were That was defined to the function itself, and then you were calling. I, I'm not exactly sure what was actually happening there. Nothing. It was barking because it said, I don't know what an X66238 CASA utils is. You didn't, de it's not a, I declared it, but nothing happened. I needed okay. a new in there to instantiate the object. Gotcha. I was thinking that would be a closure or something. I, I might be thinking about it wrong. Well, what may have also happened is because you called the function, the, the function existed, but because you weren't actually instantiating it, then the subsequent call. The, okay. the property didn't exist or the method didn't exist. Okay, I got my scripted REST API body. Here's what I got back from the scripted REST API. All my debug statements are still in there from last time. My business rule found one hit for the button Mr. Kofefe, 
and it matched this condition. So nothing happened. It did not turn on the lamp. Let's let's finish up that thought process and put that in an encapsulated thingamadoodle. The I E I I F E. So call this like run action or something like that. Yeah. Um I'm I'm actually gonna go one step further and not even name it. So then I don't have to remember what I called it. And pass it. Let's pass it nothing for now, but I would I do want to pass it something at some point. Just so you've got that info at your fingertips of, hey, this is the button that was hit. You might want to know about it. Um, like that, right? With syntax look okay? Looks good. Okay. I don't know if that's the issue or not. One more time. Hit the button. Uh, just for fun, I'm going to go scripts log off. You know what I noticed is that system logs is not a live list. It doesn't update on its own. And I still have no light turning on and off. Hmm. You know so should there be an API call going out? Uh, or I, I'm assuming there has to be, right? So yeah, that's check. what's that's what's coming out of. You want some debug statements in the outbound API? I was going to say, look at the HTTP, the app on HTTP log and see Ooh, what's showing up there. Because what I should get is you Casa Utils set device name state is going to look up. I wonder if office lamp isn't what I called it. That might help. It's office light. <laughs> Good thing that shortcut was over there. Let's try this one more time. I don't do any error check. I mean, I did an error check. I said, if if you can get it by the alias name, but I didn't say what happens if you don't get it. <laughs> flash, 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 flash. Green. Light went on. Uh, let's, do, let's do it again. I just switched over to video so okay. our audience can see. <laughs> Here, I'll turn it off with the, uh, the UI action on the other record. Because <laughs> I don't have an action to turn it off yet. There we go. I turn it off with this UI action. I will turn it on with the... All right, you got me on the camera? Yep, will, you're good. Watch. White, 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 white. It's, it flashes green, which means it sends the request. All that white flashing is, is waking up the Wi-Fi. Ah, uh, got it. Because it has to boot up and actually connect to Wi-Fi. There and There it goes. Yes. Yes, that way the battery doesn't die after a day. It's not Makes transmitting sense. everything all the time. So we have light. Let me turn that light off. Now, the, the, the other thing that I would like to pass, it's not used in this use case, but I find it very, very helpful when I do script fields, is to pass in some sort of payload of information that might be useful to other people, such as if the voltage is too low or uh, what button was actually clicked, or maybe I want to dot walk to that button or do a lookup on the, the device that was actually hit because this doesn't tell me a whole lot. So what I want to do is pass in information about the hit record. And I don't remember, but I know I see this on business rules where it says current and previous in both the upper and lower part. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a little ignorant when it comes to JavaScript in that respect. Do you know what either or both of those actually do if they're related to each other? Is one an input yeah. and one is an output? So think about it this way. The, um, the, the function expression on the inside you're just defining a function in line. Yep. And then you're calling the function at the very end on line four. And so what you're basically saying is you're calling the function, you're defining the function and calling it in one go. But if you don't pass in the value, so when you're passing in the value on line four, that then gets <clears> passed into the inner function, which is how you're you're basically passing it in. So think about it like if you were if you were defining a normal function, you would just say function my function. Right. And you would have a parameter and, and then you would call it is, with the parameter. Yeah. And and you're just doing it all in one okay. all in one go. And right. where this get gets confused in the ServiceNow world, right, is that the the uh of the, you've got two variables called hit, right? Right. One in the function definition and one, you know, one in the invocation, or, you know, one, one in the calling of the function. Let's say that you're calling on current, right? 
the one in the uh, the the upper one could be anything. Could be Fubar, um, and current would be the one that you inherit. And sometimes it can get confusing, you know, because it is very typical that you name them the same, and it 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 that kind of obscures the fact that one of those is coming from the environment. You know, one of those is coming from your. You, you, you're getting that for free. It's like being passed down by current mm -hmm. or whatever, you know. And mm -hmm. then the what other one is that is the parameter that you're calling from that bottom parentheses. So In a theory, you could call either of them anything you want as long as everything lines up. So you could call the inner one hit as long as you refer to, or you could call the inner one Bob as long as you refer to it as Bob inside the function. Okay. And you could call the outer one, you know, Chuck, as long as there's a thing called Chuck that you can actually pass, pass into in. it. And and that's that's what we're doing next is we're going to pass in values for this outer one. And that is done with my friend. Let's go back to studio. We didn't make things too big that they're ungainly. That is where we're going to add a little bit of fun to this first part of the if. And I have, for bad variable name's sake, I'm going to create an object and pass in that object, very much like current is passed in to a business rule or UI action. Uh, let's say button. And I can pass it, you know, let's make that an option, object as well. Because I'd like to know what the name of the button is. And I can get that from, whoops, not quotes yet. Oh, shame on me. I'm usually a little more persnickety about this because if you've ever run your JSON through a JSON scrubber evaluator. Mm-hmm. It barks at you if you're not using double quotes. Oops, I do actually want that one indented because that's in there. Okay, I'm just being pedantic now. It will still work. It's not a value yet. I need the, I've gotten the activity and this business rule is running on the hit table. So this is just gonna be current dot uh, button not get display value. So a question for you. Yes. Why would you do a object versus just passing in the glide record itself? Because, because um, that's a good point. Why wouldn't I just pass in current? Because that might make it even easier because then if you decide to adapt it. Yeah, uh, then I don't have to worry and, about maintaining this little orphan piece. Yeah. Okay, so let's do this. Let's, um, can you pass in current? Because current is, is kind of a special object. It's got not only properties, but it's got methods in it too. Maybe. Let's find out. So what you and, need and, to do. And, and yeah, what you may find out here is exactly why you don't do that. <laughs> We're going to find out. We'll need to put a debug statement inside of that action script. So evaluator, evaluator later, <laughs> put <Evaluator>. variable. <laughs> put variable is, I'm going to just call this hit because that's what I called it on the outer script and pass it current. Now this, this is like a setup or evaluate script it says here comes something called hit it's an object of some type or it's a variable of some type good luck have fun with it and if your function returned a value you could capture that with get variable or, or values you could capture that with a get variable so that would and be use those script. back in this to make sure that your script actually ran right maybe you're returning a positive or a negative or a count or something very nice to accept and respond to those so kind of that, like an extension point where you can give people the ability to say, hey, just run your thing and then it comes back to your code. So you can still you can still hold some control over the execution. Right. The caveat with using a script field, as you're probably all aware, is you don't give that out to your untalented non scripty people. Because if they put something in there that says, hey, let's go delete a bunch of records, you can do that in a script field <laughs> and it will happily run and you'll find yourself <laughs> out of a lot of records. Uh, and that's why we have scoped apps. 
<laughs> right. So you can't go delete records all over the system, just in the scopes you have access to. Something, something, great power. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Waiting for the blue dot to go away. I did save it. Fine. I'll click update there, too. I hit the floppy disk. That's a little small for me. I was trying to make it a little more readable on the other screen, but it just got this one too, too tiny. Why is the blue dot still there? Go away. It's being slow on me. Okay. Now, functionally, we didn't really change anything. Unless we go back to this, and let's do a gs.info. Uh, let's see. Uh, button equals hit dot get display value I think would work right we passed in current so we should have all the I think so yeah I'm really excited that... to see if this works <laughs> and I'll be really sad if it doesn't it worked when I used wide scope evaluator and other programs <laughs> <laughs> save that oh you know what else we should do while we're here let's do a turn lamp off just so I don't have to keep doing it the other way. And on a double click, we'll set that to that. In fact, let's do off button, insert, and let's do an insert so it goes back to the other record, and then I can put that same thing in on. Nah, it didn't go back to the other record. You know what I really need on this list is my display and my description. <laughs> That would help. I was wondering why this list felt kind of awkward. Get that. We, your field values, they don't translate well to lists. Nobody, nobody that I know likes reading encoded queries. So let's. Oh, speak for yourself, Chuck. I, hey, I, I, at least the condition <laughs> field, you can use a dictionary attribute called readable equals true. I don't uh, think yeah. that works on field values, and that's unfortunate because it would be really nice, especially for template value fields. Okay. On. Now our debug statements have some usability to them. Let's go to system logs all. One click for light on. And I am switching back to video. Okay. Uh, green light request. I can feel it going through the ethernet. Here it comes. Swoosh. Uh oh, there it goes. Light on. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting nervous with that latency. Okay, <laughs> double click. White, 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 white. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. A little closer. And green. Uno, dos, trace. Go for it. I think I forgot to set that parameter to zero, didn't I? Uh, I thought you did actually set it to zero. I thought I did too. Let's go verify that. <laughs> that would be sad if they both turned the light on. <laughs> But now we have a description field so we can tell which record to actually hit. <laughs> Everything turns the light on. Everything turns the light. Nobody wants to turn lights off. That's just that's just dark. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sometimes we get a little too carried away. I thought one was on though before. Oh, it was. Yeah. Okay. So, Wait. So now I probably right. mixed them all up. Lamp on should be one. All right, I probably just turned the lamp on, off, on, off. Okay, that's one. Turn lamp off. Should say zero. And I turn it to one. Now it really does turn it on. Okay, so why did... Let's go check the logs. It should say register to double click somewhere. Let's check the hit log. The hit table. Did we get an event for a double click? No. Oh, interesting. What would be additionally helpful here is a date which this was entered. So let's do created. And then we can sort that way as well, just to make doubly sure. What's the tolerance on that? Is it uh, is there a certain number of milliseconds you have to register the second um, click? It's pretty slow. I'm not going bam, bam, but uh, you know, like a mouse click. I'm going one, two. Okay, so sort Z to A. I did get a double click at 1417, which was a little while ago. So what does the log say? Ew. Hmm. Ew. Go I back in the insert. Table name. 
Is that my event? For yeah, it is. I think my insert and stay might have barfed on it. I might have something extra in there that shouldn't be. So let's go to turn lamp off. It's advanced. I don't have a table. I don't have a field value. I don't have anything else in here. Uh, if I turn advanced off, there's no table. There's no field values. What happened? Huh. Let's try that again. Let's look at the... Go turn the lamp off manually. I got to use a UI action. Now, incidentally, when I was demonstrating something similar at the uh, developer meetups, somebody gave these Amazon Dash buttons a nickname. They call them physical UI actions. I just love that name. I like that. Makes sense. It, it's perfectly logical. It, and it also reinforces our crazy terminology at ServiceNow. <laughs> Let's go to the system logs. I just want to see if that blows up in our face. I'm going to do a double click. Boom. Boom. Oh, here's the response body back from when I was trying to turn the light on or off. So that is coming back. And get a hit record. Yes, it's gone platinum. It's number one on the top 40. Okay. Let's go to the system logs. We're running out of time. We got to get Josh's idea in here. So actually, uh, you went where perfect. I was going. So I'll tell you more oh, with, about that in a minute. With the put variable? Yeah. There's okay. there's still one aspect to that we can talk about. But anyway. Invalid so, table name null. It's almost like it's trying to evaluate the first, the, the insert part. On line 22. What is line 22? Line 22 of what? Function execute rule. Oh, it's my action lookup business rule. Okay, let's go look at that. Let's go look at that. Line 22 down here. Is, we might be finding out why you don't pass a... Oh, no. Oh, it, so why is it matching that? So your act value get your act get value table is oh, oh 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 I missed something entirely. It's saying if there's a match, if there's not a match for the condition, then it's going to try and insert a record, but it didn't match anything. I forgot if advanced in here. Oh. <laughs> That would, All right. that would make sense. And here's here's something I do. Uh, you guys can give me your comments on this. Um, I'm going to get the value of the field. And interestingly enough, Boolean fields come back with a value of 0 and 1. So that is how I turn it into a Boolean so that I can read it better in the script. So when I say if advanced... <laughs> is it is advanced is advanced thank you if is advanced then i'm going to do the advanced run the scripty stuff that's new look where my cursor is between the o and the r and i hit tab it ah. indented it just nicely instead of putting a tab in the middle of my variable what if accident. I want to put tabs in the middle of my variables? <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> then my else should really go. Let me just take this out. My else should go indented there. And finish there. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to try, but I think I'm going to save it for later. What, what I'd like to see on my action record is a relationship of the hit records to the action. So why, when was this triggered? When was this one triggered? And have a, a related list of hits to that. That would be just a simple many-to-many -many table. But as the, as the lookup is done, it says, oh, this hit goes with this action. Then I got to make that many-to-many -many record as part of that business rule. So we'll There's another it. way to do that, though, without, without the oh. table. Really? Yeah. Uh, we can go there if you want. Okay. Hang on. Let's let's find out what the Franklin planner is going on here. We still want to get this light to turn on and off on its own. So we got let's make sure we're at least rid of our errors.
And let me know before you hit the button. I will okay. switch the video. I'm, I'm hitting the button and taking a drink. And video's on. Oh, you caught me drinking on camera. Oh, no. Okay, that should be light on. Oh, it's not going to blow up on me. Good. Good, good, good. 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 So it had a... It said I... I was match equals false on that one. Anyway. That was that was before. This is now. 1424, 1425. Let's refresh that one more time just to make sure we got all the goodness. Okay, lots of debug statements in here about what came in, what went out. At 142521, I go bam, bam, double hit. I think a baseball game it was at one time. Oh, the light went out. Even before the green light went out. That was amazing. Nice. I now have a lazy man's <laughs> switch for turning the lamp on which is in arm's reach <laughs> that's easier than talking to echo i won't i won't say the trigger word for anybody watching that has an echo well if you're if your spouse is asleep right you don't want to be yelling at the, the crazy home assistant hey google okay google turn off the light <laughs> they'll, so i'll roll over and smack you so let's talk a little bit about how so so we've got kind of a demo example here let's talk a little bit like the real world if, scenario if, like if all you were doing was turning the light on, like the service now is a lot of overhead. But let's say that uh, you know that this is a stand-in for something else is happening in the real world, yes. like turning the machine back on. And so maybe the double, like that's uh, you, the button is a like a failsafe uh, that logs a uh, maintenance ticket, and when that yeah. maintenance ticket is closed, that turns back on. I mean, Could that would do be that. Yep. You know, or you know, it could be anything like double clicking um, creates an incident, yep. and when that incident is approved or closed or something, then it turns that light on, right? So yeah. then there could be some service now business logic that would be necessary in the middle, right? right. I, I was thinking about it from another angle where, uh, uh, you know, we in our first story, when we did this, we said, okay, you got a dumb machine like a coffee pot and it needs filters and grounds or whatever, you push the button and an incident gets created or somebody has to service that ticket. You've got a record of when the coffee pot was empty and how many times a month does this need servicing, all that good stuff that you get out of service. Now, my other one was if you could script this, maybe you've got a critical business function. If you've ever uh, read up on, on Toyota's manufacturing processes, you know they've got this yellow cord all along the manufacturing line. And if there's a problem with quality or anything, you pull the cord and the whole manufacturing line shuts down until that's resolved. This could be a similar analogy where if you've got a critical business system and somebody pushes the panic button, you've got a light in IT that says, you know, like the klaxons on Star Trek firing. There is yeah. a problem here. You 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 better get out of your seat and go fix it because nobody gets paid until payroll systems back up or something of that nature. You know, so I like your thought as well is integrated into the process flow, whereas mine was more of a, a panic service situation. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, I, I just want to kind of get it out there that there's, like, in the real world, you're going to have something something service now -y happening between these two things, between the button press right. and, and, and the action out in the physical world. And, uh, you know, and so the other thing is, uh, you know, you could, like, the light turning on and off, you know, could very, very easily be light uh, color changing if you had one of those hues or something like that. And yep. it could be... Uh, related to the state of like the most recent incident or, you know, I mean, in a call oh, center type thing, yeah. you could absolutely, uh, you know, I, I used to like the job before here, I wrote uh, software for an operation center. And uh, like, if we had this kind of stuff, I would be turning lights on <laughs> and off <laughs> based on like, if the key was green. I mean, we, we had things like that, right? We, yeah. we had ways of what we wanted them is to always know where they're at. And uh, if I could have done that with the color of a light bulb, I uh, ten years ago, I would, that's what I would have been doing. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that's that's a really really good point. I love that because um, you, you know, on and off is one thing, but being able to go different colors, one means yeah. it's been, you know, it's received. Now it's being processed. Now it's actually, you know, now it's good to go. Um, I did a little. That's really cool. Yeah, did we a little have anything digging. out of SLA, right? And now we're yeah. red. And we have something in danger of breaching SLA, and now we're yellow, and we have, you know, we're in good on SLA. It's green. I, I did have, uh, I did some preliminary checking into the Philips API, and they're way more open. The color setting is a little more confusing. It's not just true RGB values, but it is easier to program 
the Philips Hue in terms of REST APIs than it is this TP-Link. So I encourage you to look into that. That makes sense. Cool. I predict all of us and maybe uh, like a, a significant number of the people watching this are going to be we're going to like our lives are going to be full of all these uh, weirdo APIs for the next several years. I'm, we're going to find one of my uh, my creator con lab that I'm working on is specifically around this stuff, AWS and making it do something. So, you know, mm -hmm. take these IoT buttons and we're going to have a lab at creator con about the uh, AWS IoT buttons. And we're, we're currently finding um, fiscally responsible ways to turn things on and off because what we've got right now is a bit expensive to outfit an entire lab. Cool. All right. Well, that's right. We brought this in right on time, gentlemen. So I, I, I am curious to hear Josh's idea of how to get that record into a related list, though, before we go. Just give me the, the overview and we'll see if we can implement that at a later time. Yeah, so the high level is there is a table for defining relationships, and you'll see this um, if you just go and search for relationships. We don't define relationships. Um, Episode but yeah. twelve of Tech Now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's just called relationships, if I'm yep, not mistaken. It is, and if and I could spell it right, not retaliation ships. And if I understand the relationship between these records correctly, basically what you would do is you would say, based on the current table, go and query this other table and do this comparison. And that is how you then determine which things are related. Um, and I think that will give you a quick and dirty way to pull those in. Um, you, and there you, still might be times when yeah. you want the many to many if you want to do something extra with those many to many relationships. Okay. But um, I, I think this will do the trick. I will take a look into that. I am familiar with these. And... You know, sometimes this little filter just doesn't work, and I'm not sure why. Uh, yeah, to do this, you would have, it, it, it allows you the capability of, let's get one that is advanced true. So I filter out, because I believe the advanced is where you start scripting things. And I thought there was one that had caller by, uh, incidents by same caller. But you can put in a script in here, but maybe you wouldn't even have to script this one. Yeah, I don't think you have because the scripting will allow you to dynamically determine which table. So that gets even crazier where you're oh, dynamically, okay. Okay. dynamically pulling in records from a dynamic table. Sure. Um, take that out then and take a look at an example. Of, I thought there was one that said incidents by same caller was a, a good example of this. Yeah, there. I think so. Yeah. And it actually queries the incident table from the incident table, which is incident <laughs> interesting. And it's almost like a, a, a before query business rule. Yeah. So exactly. yeah, I I may be able to get into this if if I already know what button is hit from the hit record, and the condition the condition's going to have it in the condition though. I can't dig it out of there. So I'll I'll do some digging into that. See if I can get that to work as a dynamic query like this. Cool. All right. Good stuff. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. I'm going to turn the camera back on so we can wrap things up. Yeah, me too. If I can Let's figure out how. Stop the screen sharing. Camera down here. I think it's in the same place as it used to be on the bottom. There, we all got cameras back on. <laughs> I hope. I think. Nope. Mine's not. Make sure I didn't mute by accident. <laughs> there we go. Yay. All right. All righty. Anything in the uh, chat that we need to pay attention to? Um, I was j actually just checking another different chat. Let me check. I want to see our... if you hooked us up to the clapper. Very <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, my Johnny Walker, last chance. Blue Ghost. Yeah, Ooh. nothing in the YouTube. Um, double checking on Twitch. Nothing in Twitch. Mailman Zero on Twitch. Thank you for uh, watching on Twitch. We don't we don't get a lot of the like most of the interaction happens via YouTube. It yep. is. Uh, I'm actually happy to see a uh, message on Twitch. So thank you very much. So, how how is everyone's beer this week? Jeez. Oh man, four point five. I love this. Very oh. nice. It's just candy. That's why. Yes, absolutely. It's the candy uh, the I, don't, I don't eat. The shoots fresh squeezed IPA. I don't remember what I gave it last time, but today feels like a good four. The uh, short fuse imperial stout of impending doom. This is actually so thick that you can see the viscosity as you pour it out of the can. Um, I think it's about a 3.75. It's good. It's just, it's a little much. It's like a zero W20. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, but it's that... an imperial. Is it, how, what's the ABV on that? 
Yeah, I think it's a ten and a half. So oh my gosh, it's up yeah, there. One and done. Indeed. Well, uh, this was a great return to live coding. It's always good to be back. So thank you, you everyone, for watching. Thank you, Chuck, for driving. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Have a good weekend. All right. See you.